Okay, thank you for being here. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, this obviously is not the best time to have an exam review with another exam concurrently going on, but uh, with the schedule being what it is, this was, I think, the best time to do it. So we're going to go over the first part today, which is going to be half of the questions, 1 through 17. This will be mostly a blast from the past, going over a lot of previous material that was covered on older exams, and then tomorrow we'll uh, finish up the final exam review with the newest stuff. Um, I have the notifications enabled, so if you want to send questions in by text, you can do that. I should be able to spot them as soon as they come in. And then also, um, if uh, you just have a question you want to shout it out, go ahead. That's perfectly fine as well. Um, so generally, I'll just go straight through the problems. And if you have any questions or want me to go over anything um, else that's related to that same topic, uh, please let me know, and I'd be happy to slow down and do that. Okay, so going into the first question here way back to the, the very first stuff we did. So we have a sample of iron sulfide is found to have an iron sulfur mass ratio of 1.16 to 1. How many grams of sulfur are contained in 3.50 grams of the iron sulfide sample? Now, now that we have covered more recent stuff, including moles and stoichiometry, there's actually um, fancier ways to do this. But uh, remember at the beginning, we just dealt with mass ratios. And if you're given mass ratios, then it's typically pretty simple to just set up conversion factors that allow you to do what we're doing here, which is to figure out how many grams of an element are contained in a certain mass of the compound or other sort of related relationships. Um, also keep in mind this problem, we didn't give you the exact formula of the iron sulfide. We don't tell you the charge in iron, so you really couldn't even set this up as a stoichiometry problem if you tried because you don't really know the formula of the compound you're dealing with. So what we, what we have in this problem is an iron sulfur mass ratio of 1.16 to 1. And so what that means is if, if we write that out, 1.16 to 1 iron to sulfur in terms of mass means that when we make this compound, we can combine 1.16 grams of iron plus one point, sorry, just plus one gram of sulfur. So those two would combine to make the compound in that relative amount in terms of grams. And when they combine, because of conservation of mass, 1.16 plus 1 is 2.16. They would combine to make 2.16 grams of the, co the compound, whatever the iron sulfide is. We don't know the exact formula in this problem. So we can write any of these combinations as a ratio. 1.16 grams of iron to 1 gram of sulfur, or vice versa. Or 1.16 grams of iron to 2.16 grams of the compound. Any combination of those two numbers can be set up as an, as an equivalent ratio. And so then what we're looking for in this problem is grams of sulfur. And so what we're given is we wanna find out how much sulfur is in 3.50 grams of the compound, which again, I'm gonna abbreviate as F-E-X-S-Y since we don't know the exact formula, some iron sulfide compound. And then what we wanna do is figure out which of these numbers we're gonna to use to set up the appropriate ratio. So we want to find grams of sulfur, and we want the grams of iron sulfide to cancel out. And so we're just going to use those two numbers, one gram of sulfur for every 2.16 grams of the iron sulfide. Just directly using the numbers that we were given in the problem. We don't have to convert them to percentages, although we could. And then we're going to go ahead and just uh, multiply that across in one step. And what we should get is 1.62 grams of sulfur. Okay. So that's what we were, how you would set up that problem. A lot of people in this type of problem, they, they try to make it more difficult than it is. Um, knowing now that we have information about moles and stoichiometry, they try to turn it into that type of problem. But if you're given all of the masses or the mass ratios as we were here, you can just use those directly as conversion factors and not have to worry about moles or anything more complicated than that. Okay, so any, any questions on this one? Um, let me open the chat window, make sure I can see it. All right, so nothing, nothing yet. I'm going to turn off my camera because sometimes it slows things down. Um, so you'll just have to listen to my golden tones and not be able to see my face this time. All right, so let's move on then to number two. Number two, another very old topic, was subatomic particles counting protons, electrons, and neutrons. Um, and so for this, we have to recall the anatomy of a chemical symbol. So we gave you a chemical symbol here for one of the isotopes of molybdenum. And so remember that the chemical symbol is written in generic form as some symbol A, X, sorry, X, which indicates the identity of the element. And then two numbers that can go next to that are 
abbreviated as A and Z. Now you don't necessarily need to know which abbreviation is which, which one's A, which one's Z, not so important, but we have to know what they mean when, when they're written in the symbol. So this bottom number Z, which is not always given to us, is the atomic number. So the smaller of the two numbers that is given to you is gonna be in the bottom of the symbol. That's the atomic number, and that tells us directly the number of protons. Okay, now as I said, this one is not always given to us. The reason being um, the chemical symbol, whatever X is, in this case, MO from molybdenum, that would also tell you from the periodic table how many protons there are. So each element is distinguished by the number of protons. So if we didn't give you the 42 here, the bottom number, you could just go to the periodic table, um, which I'm gonna to try to open up here in a second, and if we find MO in the periodic table in the molybdenum, um, that's here number 42. It's not letting me zoom in very easily, but uh, number 42 is, is that symbol, so that would tell you that the atomic number is 42 and it has 42 protons. So um, that part, as I said, is not always given. Here it is. Um, and then the other part of the symbol, this other number A, which goes in the top left, is the mass number. And that's going to tell you what specific isotope you're dealing with. It's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So P plus is protons, and then number of neutrons, N0. Okay, so that's going to be this, the combined number of what you call nucleons, particles in the nucleus. And then if we're dealing with a neutral atom, so if there was a charge in this, it would be indicated to the right um, as a positive or negative number. Um, and in this case, it's a neutral atom, neutral element. There's no net charge on either positive or negative side, so it's going to be the number of electrons and number of protons have to be equal in this case. So from this symbol, we have all the information we need to get all the subatomic particles. All right, um, and so if we see then Z, which is the atomic number, is 42. That's this bottom number here, 42 or we could have gotten that from the periodic table as I showed you. And this is going to be both number of protons and number of electrons because it's a neutral, um, a neutral atom we're dealing with, a neutral isotope. And so those two are going to be the same. So protons and electrons should both be 42. So that gets rid of B, that gets rid of C, that gets rid of E. So now we have to figure out how many neutrons there are to pick the correct answer choice. Now, as we said here, the mass number A is the other number in the symbol. It's 96 for this example. And that's going to be the number of protons, which is 42 that we just found out, plus the number of neutrons. And just with a little bit of algebra, 96 minus 42 means we have to have 40, or sorry, 54 neutrons for those to add up to be 96. So 54 is the number of neutrons, which means A is the correct answer for this multiple choice question. All right. So do we have any questions on subatomic particles, how to find any of those? Um, there's not going to be too many variations on these other than, again, we could potentially give you ions that have net positive or negative charge, in which case you would have to subtract or add electrons to account for the, the difference in charge. Um, but other than that, this is a pretty typical type of question that we would ask you on this topic. So anything you want me to clarify before I move on? Okay, I think we're good, then let's, let's go on and go forward. So number three, um, so number three, we're already, if you're keeping track of where we are, we're already in chapter two. The final exam is, I should mention before I started, the final exam is laid out roughly in order of the topics that we covered. So you're gonna have the, you know, chapter one stuff at the very beginning and the chapter nine stuff at the very end. It's, it's, it's basically gonna be in order. Um, and in terms of how it's weighted, you can get an idea of how it's weighted from this um, practice, uh, from this review session as well as from the practice exam on the Blackboard. It's pretty equal distribution of all the topics. You will find tomorrow when we do the second half that there are about five questions from the most recent Chapter 9 material. So that is a, maybe a little bit more heavily weighted on average than the rest. But in general, you're going to have roughly three to four questions per chapter, and it's it's a fairly equal distribution. Now, we only had really, it looks like two questions on chapter one stuff, now we're already in chapter two, so it's not perfectly equal, but you can expect there to be a few questions from each chapter at most, okay? All right, so what we have here is one of the first topics we covered in chapter two, which was properties of electromagnetic radiation. 
really more of a physics topic than a chemistry topic, but very closely related to the development of quantum mechanics, which is an important topic in chemistry that we covered in more detail. So the first question is dealing with frequency and energy of a blue photon with a wavelength of 485 nanometers. So if you recall what we did with uh, photons, there's really two key equations we need to know. So the first is that the property, the, pro the product of wavelength and frequency, lambda for wavelength frequency is abbreviated as nu, that's going to be equal to the speed of light c. And then the other one, that's the energy of the photon, is given as another constant h times the frequency. And these two equations can be combined such that the energy of the photon can also be written as h times speed of light c divided by wavelength lambda. So really it's just two equations for photons that you need to know, and then a third one that's sort of derived from those two. All right, so in this problem, um, we're given the wavelength at 485 nanometers, but for either of these equations, if we're gonna solve for frequency or if we're going to solve for energy, whatever we're asked to do, usually it's gonna be one or the other. I did both of them here so that we could review both equations, but whichever one you're doing, you need to make sure that your wavelength is converted to meters because both of these equations use fundamental constants, C, H, or both of them that are gonna be in terms of SI units. And so distance wavelength needs to be in meters. So to convert to meters, recall that nanometers is 10 to the minus nine. So 485 nanometers, and there's gonna be one meter for every 10 to the ninth nanometers, or alternatively 10 to the minus nine meters in one nanometer. So what you get is 4.85 times 10 to the minus seven meters, and now this is the number that we're going to use with both of these equations to get frequency and energy. Okay, so the frequency, we'll use the first equation to solve for nu. It's going to be C divided by lambda. And that's going to be C is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Both of these constants are on your periodic table, if you'll recall, so you don't have to memorize them. And then lambda is the number we just found in the correct units of meters, 4.85 times 10 to the minus 7. And so what we get for frequency is 6.18 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Um, so let's say there's two answer choices that have that, so I'll have to now check on the energy part. And then for the energy, there's really two ways we could do it. Now that we have the frequency, we can just multiply it by h, or we could put the original wavelength back into this form of the equation here. You'll get the same number either way. I'll just do h times the frequency since we already found what the frequency is. H is another constant, again located on your periodic table, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, and then the frequency 6.18 times 10 to the 14 hertz that we just found. And you should get 4.09 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So individual photons do tend to have very small energy, so you should get a relatively large negative exponent. If you get something that's way different than minus 19, if you got a really, really large negative number like minus 50, or if you got a positive exponent, you probably mess something up. So this is a typical range for photon energies around 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 19 joules or so. So the number makes sense, and that is gonna match up with, again, answer choice A, which has the correct frequency and wave, uh, sorry, frequency and energy. All right, any questions on, on that topic from a while back? All right, so the next thing we'll move on to then is another aspect of quantum mechanics, which is dealing with quantum numbers, subshells, and things of that sort. Um, so the, the question here is, how many electrons in a hydrogen atom can have n equals 5, and how many of these can be in the 5F subshell? Now, Normally, um, in hydrogen, you don't use the n equals 5 or the 5f subshell, but you can. If you had enough electrons, if you're loading up hydrogen with a bunch of extra electrons, they could go in there. Um, and those subshells still exist, even though they're not normally filled in the ground state. Um, so if we had an n equals 5 and we had then also that 5f subshell, how many electrons would be in each of them? <coughs> All right, so... We have some pretty useful and simple relationships that we can recall that help us do this. So if you're looking for, I should say maximum number of electrons. So if you're looking for the maximum number of electrons in a shell, so remember that a shell is defined by a value of n, 
that's going to be given as 2n squared. And then if you're looking for the maximum number of electrons, let me write it as max again, so we're clear on that. The maximum number of electrons that can go into a subshell, a subshell is going to be defined as two quantum numbers, n and l together. The equation for that is going to be 2 times 2L plus 1, where L is the value of the second quantum number that we give you. Okay, so in this problem here, we have sort of a two-part answer. First, we're going to figure out how many electrons can possibly go into an N equals 5 shell. So for that part of it, figure out how many total electrons can have N equals 5. The number that's that we can possibly have is going to be just, again, 2N squared using that equation. So 2 times 5 squared. So if you have an n equals 5 shell, you can have up to 50 electrons in there. That's the first part of our answer. And then the second part is going to be how many of these can be in the 5f subshell. So within the n equals 5 shell, you're going to have 5 subshells as well. 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f, and then I guess 5g. Um, although that wouldn't exist in the ground state of, a, of an actual um add them on the periodic table, but you'd have five subshells. You want to know for the 5F how many electrons can go into there. So because it's a 5F subshell, that's going to be defined by a value of N and L, and we're going to use the value of L to tell us how many electrons can go in there. So N equals 5 still, but we need the L value to be able to do this. So recall that usually the L value is given as a letter. L, the numerical value for L is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, starting at 0 all the way up to n minus 1. And these are going to be denoted with letters S, P, D, F, and then after this it goes more or less alphabetical, G, H, I, and so on. But anyway, the one we're looking for is 5F, which means L equals 3. And so that means the maximum number of electrons in this 5F subshell, or any subshell that has L equals 3, is going to be 2 times 2L plus 1, so 2 times 6 plus 1, which is 14. So in any F subshell, whether it's 4F, 5F, 6F, whatever F, you can have 14 electrons. So the correct answer for this problem would be the two numbers separated by a comma, 50, 14, so 50 electrons at in total can go into the n equals 5 shell, but 14 of those could be in the 5f subshell. Okay, so do we have any questions on this problem or quantum numbers in general? All right, everyone's quiet today, so we'll just keep moving on. Number five is um, we want to know the atomic symbol and the number of unpaired electrons for the element that has the following electron configuration. So the other, once we sort of define what subshells and orbitals and all those things are, the next thing we did, if you recall, is we figured out for an element on the periodic table how to predict how many electrons go into each of those subshells. And we used primarily the off-bow principle, which is the building up of filling low energy subshells to high energy subshells. Uh, and then there's some additional considerations that come into play as well that we'll see in this problem also, namely um, the, the Hund's rule where you want to maximize unpaired electrons. Okay, so the first part of this though is let's figure out the atomic symbol that we're dealing with here. So we should know how to read this configuration and pinpoint where we are in the periodic table. Um, although there is a shortcut that I'll also reveal here in a second. But let's first just go to the periodic table to figure out which element this is. So this tells us that the, the core electrons are going to be krypton, and then our valence electrons are going to be 5s2, 4d6. So if we go to where that is on the periodic table, um, so krypton is here, number 36, and the element that we're dealing with in this problem is 5s2, 4d6. Is that right? Did I get, or is it 4? Yeah, 4d6, sorry. Um, so we're going to go back to that. Um, and so if we want to find that element, let me remove that not not notation so I get confused there. So it's krypton, then 5s is over here, 5s, 1, 2. And then 4d is the next part of the periodic table, 4d, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the symbol is going to be Ru, which is ruthenium. 
So that's the first part of this. We've identified the, sorry, wrong operation. We've identified that the atomic symbol we're dealing with is Ru ruthenium. And now we need to figure out the number of unpaired electrons. Now before we do that, let me reveal the shortcut, which is that if we're giving you the electron configuration, you don't necessarily need to think about which exact subshells are filled. You can just look at the total number of electrons that are in there. So if we look at the total number of electrons, Krypton is number 36, as we saw, so there's 36 core electrons. 5s2 has, so there's two more electrons there. 4d6, six electrons, so 36 plus 8 is 44. So that means this atom should have 44 total electrons. And if we know how many electrons it has, we can just find number 44 on the periodic table because we're dealing with a neutral element here. We're not dealing with any sort of ions. And so we can also identify it as Ru ruthenium that way. So the shortcut, if you're given the configuration, is just count the number of electrons and then find the atomic number on the periodic table. So 44 electrons, that has to be ruthenium. Um, the configuration is, that's given is correct, but you don't need, necessarily need to think about it in that level of detail just to identify the element. But for the other part of the question, we do have a little bit of work to do. So we're looking for the number of unpaired electrons. So to figure out how many unpaired electrons are, we have to look at any partially filled subshell that's in the electron configuration. So in this uh, element, in this configuration here, the noble gas core is completely filled. 5s subshell is completely filled with its two electrons, but we do have a partially filled 4d subshell. So if you'll recall, we can put up to 10 electrons into a 4d subshell. Remember that the, the d block of periodic table has 10 elements in it which tells us that we can put 10 electrons into those different D subshells, 3D, 4D, or 5D. And that means we have then five orbitals available. Sorry, I keep messing this up. Um, so we have five orbitals available in the 4D subshell. So if we want to figure out how many unpaired electrons are, we have to actually write out, symbolize the five orbitals, and then we're going to fill them up with electrons. And we remember that we're going to follow Hun's rule when we do this, where we're going to add one electron to each orbital first before we start pairing them up. So we have six electrons to put into the 4D subshell. And so we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's going to leave all four of these unpaired. So we're going to have four unpaired electrons. So the correct answer for this is the time of symbol and number of unpaired electrons is going to be ruthenium for the symbol four unpaired electrons, that's how we would enter the answer. All right, so for unpaired electrons, you do have to do a little bit of work and at least look at any partially filled subshells to figure out how the electrons are arranged. You wanna maximize the number of unpaired electrons and you do that by adding one electron to each orbital before pairing them up. And so that's gonna leave four unpaired in this case. So I think we had a question come in, so let me look at what that is. So the question was, how, can you repeat how you found the total number of electrons? Okay, so the way that we did that was um, we gave you the configuration, which has Krypton in brackets, KR, 5s2, 4d6. So if we go to the periodic table, we can see that KR is atomic number 36. And so that means there's 36 core electrons. And then we're going to add to that the electrons that are listed in the valence electron configuration. So 36 core electrons two electrons from the 5s, six more electrons from 4d, so 36 plus 2 plus 6 is 44. So anytime we give you the electron configuration, you can just add up the total number of electrons, figuring out first how many electrons are in the core, and then adding up however many electrons you have as valence electrons outside of the core. And that gives us, in this case, 44. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. Um, and it's in many cases, a faster way of doing this. Um, so I think there's another question roll in. It says, for unpaired electrons, if you recognize that the d orbital only holds 10 electrons, can we just subtract 10 minus 6 to get 4? Uh, that would work if you had more than 5 electrons, but I wouldn't take that as a general shortcut because if there was 3 d electrons, you would not have seven unpaired. So it does work here if, if the if the subshell is more than half filled, but I wouldn't try to remember that as a shortcut because 
it would work for six, seven, eight, or nine D electrons, or five, I guess, five, five through, it would work for if it's half filled or more, but it would not work for anything less than half filled. So if you have one D electron and so on. So it, you can sort of use shortcuts like that if you remember that for some shells that are less than half filled, the number of unpaired electrons is just how many electrons you have. For subshells that are more than half filled, it would be in this case 10 minus that, but it's not the easiest thing to remember. So I think in general, drawing them out is the, the better way to do it, but that would give you the right answer what you described. Okay, um, any other questions coming in? All right, so for number six, um, we're back to quantum numbers again. So uh, I will, Warn you, whoever whoever wrote this final exam a long time ago, we've since modified it gradually. But when it was originally put together, the, whoever put this together seemed to like quantum numbers as a topic. So there are a few questions on this, and that's why I'm giving you a few on this review. So make sure you're prepared for that. The first one, this one we want to know, what is a valid set of quantum numbers for an F electron? Um, and so we have in quantum numbers, we're giving you a set of four numbers here. And so what do they all mean? So the first one we already talked about a little bit is the principal quantum number N. The second quantum number that's listed is L. And then the two that we haven't really dealt with yet in any of these problems are gonna be the third listed is M sub L, and then the last one, M sub S. Now it's helpful, not for this problem necessarily, but in general to know what do these quantum numbers mean. So just as a quick review of that, N is gonna tell us the size and energy of the subshell, or the orbital that that, that electron is in. Um, so it relates to the size and energy of the orbital. L is going to tell us what shape the orbital is. So we said L is usually designated as letter S, P, D, and F, and they all have different shapes. S is spherical, P is sort of figure eight shaped, D is four leaf clover. Anything beyond that is way too complicated for us to worry about. And then also L does contribute to the energy of the orbital if it's a multi-electron atom, so anything besides hydrogen. The L value is important for energy as well. M sub L is related to the orientation of the orbital. So for anything where L is one or higher, one, two, three, and so on, the orbitals are gonna be oriented differently in space and that's related to the M sub L value. And then M sub S is a property of an electron which is the, it's called the spin of the electron, and it's either gonna be plus one half or minus one half. Those are the only two allowed values, and they don't depend on any of the other previous quantum numbers. Now in this question here, we're dealing with, we're looking for an F electron. Recall that the letter in the subshell or orbital designation is related to the second quantum number L. And we already saw this in a previous problem, but L can be zero, one, two, three, and so on. These are the four most common that you'll find in the ground state of, of um, elements on the periodic table. And these relate to the letters S, P, D, and F. So once again, if we're looking for an F electron, L needs to be three. That means the second quantum number needs to be three. So we can get rid of choice B because it has the wrong L. And we can get rid of choice E, which also has the wrong L. So we don't even have to look at the rest of the quantum numbers in these lists because they don't have the correct L value, which needs to be three for an F electron. Now for the rest of these, we do have to think about some of the rules that relate all these quantum numbers together. So in some sense here, we're working backwards because the rules are given as N can be any positive integer. So N can be one, two, three, four, and so on. L depends on the value of N that you have. So the allowed values of L are gonna be zero, one, to all the way up to whatever n minus one is. Um, and so what this means for us is that if we're in an L equals three subshell, an F subshell, the value of n has to be larger than or equal to four, okay? Because L can be no bigger than n minus one, so n has to be four or larger for L equals three to even exist, all right? Um, if n was, three, two, one, you would not have an L equals, you would not have an L equals three or F subshell even possible. So what that means is that we can eliminate choice A because choice A does not have a large enough N value. Right, in other words, if N equals three as is given in choice A, 
you cannot also have L equals 3. And then for the last two C and D, we have to think about the rules for M sub L. M sub L is going to be the only one that could be possibly negative, and it goes from negative L, including 0, all the way to positive L. Okay? So that means if L equals 3, the allowed M sub L values are going to be negative 3 to positive 3. So minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Any of these could be possible M sub L values. And what we see is that in choice D here, it has an M sub L value of minus 4, which is not allowed for an L equals 3 uh, electron. So that one's going to be out as well, leaving choice C as the only viable answer, which has the correct value of L and a value of N and a value of M sub L that would also correspond with that and be possible um, combinations. All of the M sub S values were given as plus one half, which is fine. So none of the M sub S values had any problems with them, but we had to think about the relationships between NL and M sub L to be able to answer this problem. All right, so do we have any questions or any clarifications on the quantum numbers? The question that came in was, how would you determine if it were positive or negative one half? Um, so in reality, for a single electron, it can be either one, it doesn't matter. So in this case, we're just talking about the quantum numbers for a single electron, and whether it was plus one half or minus one half, that would be fine. The only restriction on the M sub S values is that if you're putting two electrons into the same orbital, one of them has to be M sub S equals plus one half, one of them has to be M sub S minus one half. So the plus one half minus one half is often referred to as spin up, spin down. So that's the only restriction on, on M sub S is that if it's two electrons in the same orbital, one must be one half, one must be minus one half. If you're just giving random quantum numbers for a single electron, then whether it's plus one half or minus one half has no bearing, either of those would have been fine. So we could have had some of these as plus one half, some of these as minus one half, and it wouldn't have mattered. We wouldn't eliminate them on that as long as it's one of those two numbers. Um, Okay, so that's the only restriction that and that's the best. Usually we're going to only think about, in most cases, the first three quantum numbers and their relationships, which was all we really needed to do for this problem. All right, anything else? All right, and then another topic related to some extent to quantum numbers and um, is the electronic transitions in a hydrogen atom. So there's a lot of mostly numerical problems on this topic where we have a hydrogen atom that has uh, you know different n values one two three four and so on and an electron moves between those different n values either from a lower value to a higher value or from a higher value to a lower value in this problem here we have a transition from n equals four to n equals two and we want to know what is the wavelength of the photon that is absorbed or emitted during this transition Without doing any math at all, we can figure out if the photon is absorbed or emitted. So as we said, in hydrogen atoms, you have energy levels that are determined by the value of n. n equals 1 is lowest energy, then n equals 2, and so on. And in hydrogen, where you only have one electron, the energy level is only determined by n. It doesn't matter what L or M sub L is. For multi-electron atoms, N and L are needed to determine energy levels, and we don't have simple equations to relate those. But for hydrogen, the, the value of N determines energy, and it's only the value of N that you need, and it's going to go lowest to highest from the smallest values to the highest values of N. In this problem, we're going from N equals 4 to N equals 2, and so anytime you go from higher N value to lower N value, that means the electron is losing energy, and the way that it loses that energy is by emitting a photon of light. So anytime the value of n is going larger to smaller, you have a photon emitted. So without doing any math, we can figure out that part of the answer already because we're going from higher n to lower n. If we were going in the opposite direction, from lower n to higher n, that means the electron is gaining energy, and that means it's absorbing the energy from a photon. All right, so that means the only answer choices we can pick are ones where it says the photon is emitted. So it's not going to be choice A, it's not going to be choice C. Both of those say that the photon is absorbed, which would only be true if we were going from small n to big N. Now we have to do the math to figure out which of these wavelengths, if any of them, is correct. And so there's a couple ways to do this. Some of you are familiar with what's called the Rydberg equation, which is actually one that 
has wavelength directly, that would be useful to use here. Um, I didn't teach that way, and I don't really want you to have to memorize two equations necessarily. So the way that I always did it in class was to just first use what's called the Bohr equation to calculate the change in energy delta E for the electron. So you have this constant out front, which you'll want to make sure you know, the Bohr constant minus 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And then it's determined, the delta E is going to be determined by the two end values, final minus initial. All right. For a problem like this where you're getting wavelength, it doesn't actually particularly matter if you get the values of n in the right order, but we'll, we'll stay consistent with what we have. So we're going to put this constant, and then the two n values are going to be the final value of n is where we end up. That's going to be n equals 2. The initial value of n is going to be 4. So 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 4 squared, that whole thing multiplied by the constant. And so we get a negative delta E, which is what we should get because we're going from a higher value to a lower, a higher energy value to a lower energy value. And the number is minus 4.0888 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And then basically the absolute value of this number is the energy of the photon that would be, in this case, emitted. So the energy of the photon is going to be just the positive of that. And that's going to be equal to HC over lambda. All right, so that means the energy of the photon is equal to 4.0888, or sorry, 88 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, just take off the minus sign. And then we're gonna set that equal to HC over lambda and solve for lambda. So lambda is gonna be HC divided by the energy of the photon. And so it's just gonna be now some some math to get that. So the constants are H and C, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And then the energy of the photon, as we just found, is 4.088 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So what we get is 4.86 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, and then we're going to multiply that by 10 to the 9th to get nanometers, which is the answer, the, the units that all our answers have, and so it comes out to 486 nanometers. All right, and so that's going to be then choice B. We'll emit a photon of 486 nanometers during this transition. Okay, any questions on the Bohr model or related topics? Or all right, I don't think I've seen anything come in. Let me try to miss any. Nope, so let's just go forward then with the next one. All right, and then one of the other major topics in chapter two, chapter three, were um, atomic and ionic radii. So uh, we, in this case, we have a mixture. We have we have one neutral atom, argon. We have a bunch of ions as well. I want to know which ones is the largest from this list. All right, and so there's a few different ways we, a few different sort of rules we want to look at for comparing the sizes of atoms and ions. If you're dealing with ions, the first thing you need to look at is you can't just go by the position of the periodic table. You have to first think about how many electrons each of these has and what the electron configuration would be. So let's do that quickly for all of these to figure out what would the electron configuration be for all of these in shorthand notation. So if we go to the periodic table, the answer choices that we have here are, we have calcium two plus, so calcium is number 20. If we take away two electrons, that's gonna have the argon configuration. Potassium with the one plus charge, K plus, we take away one electron, we still have the argon configuration. Argon itself is choice C, that has the argon configuration, of course. And then Cl minus, if we add one electron to chlorine, we're going to also get to 18 electrons, which is the argon configuration. So the first four answer choices all have the same electron configuration, which is the argon configuration if we're using that abbreviation. But then if we go to Br minus, which is choice E, Br is down here, number 35. If we add one electron, we're going to have 36 electrons and have the krypton configuration. So whenever you're dealing with ions, it is helpful to keep that in mind. What's the electron configuration that I'm dealing with? So we have argon configuration for all of the first four, and then krypton for the last one. 
So if we compare choices A through D, which have the same configuration, we call these isoelectronic, that's the name for ions that have the same number of electrons, or, or any atom or ion, iso meaning the same. And the way that we compare the sizes of these is that the more negative charge you have, meaning the less protons you have in the nucleus, that is going to correlate, that's going to be the one that's the largest. So if we're ordering choices A through D, the one with the most positive charge is going to be the smallest, that's calcium, and then they're going to go in that exact order. So for the first four, this is the order of their radius. The ones with positive charge are the smallest, the ones with negative charge are the largest. Out of these first four, Cl- is the largest. But then to figure out if it's the largest one overall, we have to compare it to Br-. And we see that these are both 1- anions. One of them has the argon configuration, one of them has the krypton configuration. Jumping back quickly to the periodic table, we see argon is up here, krypton is below it. As we go down a group of the periodic table, as we go from top to bottom, the radius will progressively increase. So that means in this problem here, Br- minus is going to be larger because the radius increases as we go down a group. Another way to think about this is where are the outermost electrons in these ions? In this case, it's going to be 3p, and Br- is going to be 4p. That's where those last electrons go. And as you go, we said earlier that the value of n determines the size of the subshell. So if you're putting electrons into the n equals 4 versus the n equals 3, they're going to be on average further away from the nucleus. And so anytime you go to a whole outer subshell, if you add another subshell, you're going to get bigger and bigger. So for both of those reasons, however you want to think about it, Choice E would be the one that's the largest. It has the most electrons, and those electrons are going to be, on average, furthest away from the nucleus. Okay, so do we have any questions on atomic or ionic radius? Okay, it's also helpful to know the periodic trends, especially if you're comparing a bunch of neutral atoms to each other. But here we had atoms and ions, so that's why we had to think about first what the configuration of all those was before we started the comparisons. All right, on to number nine. Another periodic trend that we learned is ionization energy. And so if you'll recall, ionization energy, what it means is it's the amount of energy or the change in energy required to remove an electron. So we start with a neutral atom in the gas phase. And then ionization refers to removing an electron to make a positive cation. And so the delta E for this, or delta H for this process, is going to be what's called ionization energy. And then each time we remove another electron, we can have second, third, fourth ionization energies, and so on. In this case, we're just comparing the first ionization energy, so we don't have to worry about subsequent processes. And we can use the periodic table to help us. So if you recall for the periodic table, ionization energy increases from the bottom to the top. And it also generally increases from left to right. So if, if you have a periodic table, these are the directions that you're going to have increasing ionization energy. But we have to recall a couple of breaks in the trend potentially. So we have group 2 and group 5, group 2 being the NS2 configuration, group 5 being NS2 NP3 with a half-filled P subshell. These ones have abnormally high ionization energies. So they're going to actually be higher than the group that's to the right of them, even though the general trend is left to right. So there are some exceptions to think about. We'll see if they matter here. So if we go through and compare these elements here, sodium, boron, aluminum, magnesium, and calcium, um, the first thing to do is let's figure out which of these um, are in the same row of the periodic table. So I believe that these three are all in the same row, sodium, aluminum, and magnesium. We're looking for the smallest ionization energy here. Um, so if we go back to the periodic table, uh, for those three choices which are all in the same row, sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, we expect the ionization energy to be smallest all the way to the left. So sodium would be the smallest, magnesium would be uh, abnormally high because it's group 2, and then aluminum will be sort of in between. 
So as we go from sodium to magnesium to aluminum, the one that's the smallest is always going to be the one that's all the way to the left, which is sodium. Okay? So between... Sorry, I keep messing this up. I'll figure this out eventually. So between those three, sodium, magnesium, and aluminum, we expect them to go in this order. The important part is that for those three, which are all in a row, sodium is furthest to the left. So that's the smallest one so far. <coughs> and now we have to compare sodium to boron. This is not the easiest comparison because they're not directly related to each other in the periodic table, but boron is up here in the second row, sodium is down here in the third row, and typically as you move down the periodic table, um, especially these are both sorted towards the left, as you go down the periodic table, going down is going to have a bigger effect. So this is going to be, uh, we expect it to be smallest, is to the left and is below, and so both of those are going to contribute to sodium being smaller than boron. So the ionization energy would decrease as we go down, decrease as we go to the left. So sodium is still smaller than boron. And then the last comparison we have to make is sodium versus potassium. See which one of those is the smallest. And we see that those two are directly on top of each other. Ionization energy decreases as you go down, increases as you go up. And so that means between sodium and potassium, you're going to have potassium being the one that's the smallest. It's going to decrease as you go down this column here. All right, so out of all the answer choices, then potassium is going to be the one that's the smallest. So sometimes for these comparisons, it's helpful to do one at a time or to find the most obvious comparisons first and start eliminating choices. That's what I tried to do here. However you do it, though, we said that you know ionization energy tends to be Largest as you go up and to the right, smallest as you go down and to the left, and potassium is the element that's the furthest to the left and the furthest down out of all of these, so that's the obvious choice if we're just looking for the smallest one. So any questions on ionization energy or other periodic trends? Okay, I don't think I've seen any, so we'll keep going. Next question deals with ionic formula, so uh, you know, the, ch the chapter three topics included um, formulas and names for ionic and covalent compounds, and that's what we're doing here. So a lot of questions on the exam are set up like this, and some students get confused about, you know, what do we do with the first sentence here? So we're telling you here that the formula for the oxide of gold is Au2O3. Then we want to know which of the following is the formula for gold, hydrogen, carbonate, assuming the gold has the same formula, sorry, the same charge as the oxide. So People get confused about what we do with this information. As the, the last part of this question tells you, we're giving you the formula of the oxide just so you can figure out what is the charge on the metal. So we're typically gonna do this for transition metals where the metal can have possibly a few different charges. And so you're gonna use the formula of the oxide to figure out what the charge on the metal actually is. So we have Au2O3 is the charge of the oxide, because if we're going to find the formula of any ionic compound, in this case the one we're going to eventually do is gold, hydrogen, carbonate, we need to know the charge on the metal and we need to know the charge on the anion. And so the first part of this, we're going to use this information in the first sentence to find out what's the charge on the metal, Au, gold in this case. All right, so as you'll recall from the periodic table, we can predict the charges of anions. So if you have an oxide where oxygen is acting as the anion, Oxygen is here in group six, the second, or sorry, third to last column, and it's going to tend to form minus two anions because it has to gain two electrons to get to the stable noble gas configuration. So that means oxide is going to be two minus charge. So in gold oxide, we have oxygen is going to have two minus charge, and there's three of them. So we have a total of six negative charges from the oxides, and that means gold we have two of them in the formula. They have to have plus six charges to balance, and that means each gold has to be three plus to make it a six plus charge to balance out the negative charge from the oxygen. So that's, that tells us then that the charge on gold in this case is gonna be plus three. So to figure out the formula for gold, hydrogen, carbonate, what we need to do is pair up gold three plus with the hydrogen carbonate anion. 
So to figure out what hydrogen carbonate is, recall that carbonate is CO3 two minus. And then for any of these polyatomic anions that have more than one negative charge, we can also add one or more hydrogens to the formula and then decrease the charge. We basically add H plus to the formula. So if you have hydrogen carbonate, what that means you do is you add a hydrogen to the front of this carbonate formula, HCO3, and then you decrease the charge from minus two to minus one. So you also have the same thing for sulfate, phosphate being the two other very common ones where you can add hydrogen to the front of the formula and reduce the charge or the magnitude of the charge um, by an appropriate amount for however many hydrogens you add. So hydrogen carbonate would be one hydrogen out front in the formula and the charge goes from minus two to minus one because we've added formally an H plus. So this is the anion that we have that we're gonna pair with gold three plus, HCO3 minus. And then we need to make sure that the charges are balanced. And so if this is a three plus charge and this is a negative one anion, we can make the charges the subscripts. And what it tells us is that we need three anions to balance the three plus charge from the gold, from the metal. And so the final formula would be gold with three of these hydrogen carbonate anions, AUHCO3 taken three times. So the one that matches up with that one is going to be choice C here. We don't put the hydrogen out front in the formula. For any ionic compound, we still start with the metal first. And then the whole thing is going to be grouped together as one anion in parentheses, and we're going to have a total of three of those to balance charge. All right, do we have any questions on this one or on how to find formulas for ionic compounds in general? All right, make sure I don't miss any. I don't see any questions coming in. So let's plug forward. Now you guys lucked out to some extent because normally number 11 on the final exam would have been a lattice energy calculation. And that was uh, without question the last several times I taught this course, everybody's least favorite topic. But we've omitted it this semester and your textbook's gonna omit it in all future versions of the textbook. So you guys are the first lucky batch of student not to have to deal with lattice energy. I think it's fun, but we always have different definitions of what fun is, so you guys may not have. But we're not gonna do that, so I'm just gonna give you one other problem then on properties of chemical bonds, which is another potential topic that can be covered on the final exam. So in this problem here, we wanna know which of the following is order of decreasing bond strength, meaning the strongest bond first, and then the, the weakest bond last. So there's two things you wanna look at when you're comparing how strong a bond is. So the first is bond order, meaning is it a single, double, or triple bond? And the higher the bond order implies that the bond is stronger. So the strongest bond is gonna be the ones that have the highest bond order. And then the other thing you need to consider when you're talking about bond strength is if you're comparing bonds that have the same bond order, the next thing you wanna look at is the bond length. And if you have a longer bond, that would be a weaker bond. So basically bond order and bond strength are directly related. Higher bond order means higher bond strength. Bond length and bond strength are inverse related. If you have a longer or high, higher bond length, you're going to have a weaker bond or lower bond strength. So those are those two relations we have to keep in mind for this problem. Typically, the first thing you want to look at is bond order because bond order has a much bigger effect on the bond energy than the bond length does in general. So if you go from a single to a double to a triple bond, I mean, you're not gonna double the bond strength going from single to double, but it's actually fairly close to, so you're gonna, you know, it's almost a doubling effect if you go from a bond order of one to a bond order of two, and then you can have another multiplier if you go from bond order of two to bond order of three. So that's a big effect. If you're just comparing things that have different bond lengths, it's a more subtle effect. So you always wanna look at bond order first, and then look at bond length second. So in this problem, if we're looking for decreasing bond strength, meaning we're gonna put the strongest bond first in the list, we wanna first look at the bond order of all of these. Our answer choices are CO single bond, CO double bond, CS single bond. So the one that's gonna be strongest then is gonna be the one that has the highest bond order. Again, that's the first thing we look at. 
and only one of these has a, has a bond order greater than one. So the strongest is going to be the carbon oxygen double bond. It's the only one in the list that has a bond order of two, so it has to be the strongest. So if we're listing these in decreasing bond strength, this one should come first, which means that we can take A, B, and C all out because they don't have this bond listed first. So bond order is really the first thing we want to look at because that's the strongest determinant of bond strength. But from there, if we're, if we're forced to compare bonds that have the same bond order, which we have to for CO and CS, then we have to figure out which of these is longer to figure out which one is weaker and stronger. And so remember, the bond length is going to be determined by the relative sizes of the atoms that are bonded together. So here we have carbon bonded to oxygen. Here we have carbon bonded to sulfur. They share carbon. And so basically, whichever one of these is larger between oxygen and sulfur is going to give us the longer bond to carbon. The bond length can be thought of in some sense as the sum of the atomic radiuses. If you have two atoms with a small radius bonded together, that gives you a small bond length or short bond length. If you have two atoms with a large atomic radius, that gives you a longer bond length. So between oxygen and sulfur, which one of these is larger? If we go to the periodic table, we see that they're both right on top of each other. And the atomic radius will increase as we go down. So that means sulfur is going to be larger than oxygen. And that means the carbon-sulfur bond should be longer than the carbon-oxygen bond. All right. So on the basis of bond length, carbon-sulfur is going to be longer than carbon-oxygen. And because bond length and bond strength are inversely related, the bond that is longer is going to be weaker, if we're just comparing these two and the bond that is shorter is going to be stronger. So the last two in the list, if we're going from strongest to weakest, should be CO next, carbon oxygen being in the middle, and then carbon sulfur being the weakest because it's the longest bond and it has the smallest bond order. So that would leave choice D here as the correct answer. So it's really, this problem shows us that there's two factors that influence the bond strength. The bond order and the bond length are both things we have to consider when we're doing this. Um, bond order being the first thing you want to look at. If you're comparing bonds that have the same bond order, in this case two single bonds, you look at the bond length, which comes from the atomic radius of the atoms that are bonded together. Okay, do we have any questions on that topic? All right, moving on then to number 12. So the other type of problem you could have on the test that deals with the properties of covalent bonds, bond strength, bond length, and so on, would be problems like this where you have to calculate and, or estimate the enthalpy change. Now, back when we did these problems early on in the course, we called this delta E. In reality, it's delta H. And, re and the way that we did this, I'll call it delta H now because now we know what delta H is. It's not much different than delta E. Um, but anyway, the way that we did this is if we give you all the bond energies, what you have is that delta H, again, back then we called it delta E, but really is delta H. We just didn't want to confuse you with terminology. You can estimate that by taking the sum of the bond association energies on the reactant side, where you add up the energy of each individual bond that's on the reactant side, and then subtract that from the sum of the bond association energies that are on the product side. Okay. Now we have to make sure that we keep straight the two approaches that we used to calculate delta H. If we're using bond energies, this is how we do it. Reactants minus products, and you have to consider each individual bond. The way that we did it more recently in chapter seven was using the delta H of formation, in which case it was products minus reactants. And instead of having to consider each individual bond, you just had a formation enthalpy for each reactant and product that you had to then uh, combine in that way. So there's two related but uh, slightly different ways of calculating delta H or estimating it. Um, and the first way that we learn, which is what this problem deals with, is using the bond association energies to do that. And the way that you'll know is that we're giving you here not a list of delta H or formation values, we're giving you a list of bond energies. So of course it's a dead giveaway that that's what you need to do. To be able to do this properly though, we have to know the bond order of everything we're dealing with, and especially for the carbon oxygen bonds, because we're giving you here carbon oxygen single, carbon oxygen double, carbon oxygen triple bond, and you see that they're all 
vastly different from each other. As we talked about in the last problem, as you increase the bond order, you increase the bond strength and it almost doubles going from single to double bond and then multiplies by about one and a half going from double to triple. So it's a pretty big effect. So we need to know both for this reactant here and for the product, what is the bond order that we're dealing with. All right. Um, and so the way we're going to do that then is we have to draw Lewis structures to figure out what the bond order is. So I'm not going to go through that in great detail. We'll have a Lewis structure problem here in a little bit. But if we draw the Lewis structure for carbon monoxide, CO, it ends up as a carbon oxygen triple bond. And it has to be this way to complete the octet on both atoms. So CO is a little bit of a weird Lewis structure. You don't usually have triple bonds to oxygen. And if you look at formal charges, it's actually positive on oxygen, negative on carbon, which is also strange. But this is the only way to draw the Lewis structure of CO where you complete the octet. So CO is a triple bond, helpful to know that. And then we have two H2s, so each of those is going to have an HH single bond. And then on the product side, we have methanol, CH3OH. So CH3 tells us that the carbon is bonded to three hydrogens. Carbon tends to only make four bonds. It can only make four bonds, and so at the most. And so that means the bond to oxygen has to be a single bond. It can't be a double or triple bond, or you'd have too many bonds to carbon. And then OH means that the oxygen is also bonded to hydrogen. This would have lone pairs as well, but for this problem, we don't really need to know about lone pairs. We just need to know how many bonds there are and what the bond order is. So then what we can do is we can add all these together. So on the reactant side, we have one carbon oxygen triple bond. which as we see up here has a bond energy of 1070 kilojoules per mole. So one carbon oxygen triple bond, bond energy of 1070, so that's how much we get from that. And then we have two HH bonds, two moles of hydrogen each with one HH bond. So two HH bond strengths to account for on the reactant side. And that's gonna be two times 432. That's 864 kilojoules. And so then when we add those together, the sum of those is going to be 1934. I'm going to badly run out of room here, but I'll try to get this in without too much of a mess. And then on the product side, we're going to also add up all the bond energies. So we just have one product, but it has several different bonds in it. So we see that the CH3OH has three CH bonds. So we're going to take that number and multiply it by 3 for the CH bonds. We see in our list that it's 413 kilojoules per mole. We have a carbon-oxygen single bond. Again, it's important to get that bond order correct to make sure we use the right number for the carbon-oxygen bond. So one carbon-oxygen single bond and the bond energy is 358 up here, 358. And then the last product bonds that we have is the OH bond, one of those. And the OH bond strength is the last number here, 467, given up above in the problem. So for problems like these, we're going to give you all of the bond energies typically. It's also possible that you would have to solve for a bond energy if we gave you delta H. But here we're just giving you the bond energies, and you have to find delta H, so all the bond energies will be given. You just have to make sure you use the right ones. And so when we add these up on the product side, this number plus this number plus that number, we get 2,064 kilojoules. And then finally, to get delta H, as we set up here, it's going to be reactants minus products. So it's going to be this number, which is 1934. That's the sum of the bond energy on the reactant side. The sum on the product side that we just found was 2,064. And we get minus 130 kilojoules. All right, and I guess I didn't specify an answer format, so this would be either multiple choice or numerical, and you would put the answer in correctly, however we've asked you to format it. All right, so that was a review of the first method we learned for estimating delta H, where we're using individual bond energies.
Um, and it's more of, a, of an accounting game than anything, just making sure that we know the bond orders that we're dealing with, we know how many of each bond, and then it's just keeping track of all the different numbers we have, adding them up on the reaction side, adding them on the product side, and subtracting the two. So any questions on that? All right, going on to number 13, we're getting close to wrapping this first half up. This one does deal with Lewis structures, um, and that's an important topic both on its own as well as for some of the topics that are related in Chapter 4. So we're sort of towards the end of Chapter 3 now for keeping track of where we are in the course. And for the Lewis structure of chlorite that obeys the octet rule, what is the formal charge on the central atom? So the first thing we need to do is get the uh, correct formula for chlorite. So this is a review of polyatomic ions. Chlorite is ClO2 minus. We have hypochlorite, which is ClO minus. Chlorite is ClO2 minus. Chlorate, ClO3 minus. And perchlorate, which is ClO4 minus. So a whole series of those chlorine oxyanions. Chlorite is the one that has two oxygens in it. And so the first step in drawing a Lewis structure, once you have the formula of the compound or the ion, is to count electrons. So we have a chlorine in this, and we're going to go to the periodic table to count electrons. We have chlorine and oxygen are the two elements. And from the periodic table, the location in the periodic table of each element tells us how many valence electrons it has. So chlorine is here in group 7A, meaning that it has seven valence electrons. Oxygen is in group 6A, so it'll have six valence electrons, so we're going to use those numbers to total up how many we have in the whole ion. So chlorine, each one has seven valence electrons, and there's one in the formula. We have two oxygens in the formula. Each one is going to have six valence electrons, so that's 12. And then we also have to remember that this is an anion with a negative charge, and so that means we have one extra electron to add because of the one minus charge. So what we get in total then for this is 20 electrons. So when we draw the Lewis structure, we're going to use 20 total valence electrons. And the other thing we notice in this problem is that it's telling us explicitly that we have to obey the octet rule. So obeying the octet rule means that we're not going to have any more than eight electrons around any of the atoms in the structure. Okay. So if you um, go beyond eight electrons, that's technically a violation of the octet rule, and here we're specifying that you should obey the octet rule. So if we go for ClO2 minus, what we're going to do is the least electronegative atom, chlorine, goes in the center, and it's one there's only one of, so it's pretty obvious that's the central atom. We're going to start with single bonds to each oxygen, and then we're going to complete the octet of each oxygen by adding six more, or three lone pairs of electrons. All right, so that's going to be a total of 16 electrons. Each oxygen has eight around it, two from the bond, six more that we just added. That's a total of 16 for the two oxygens. We have 20 that we can use, so we're going to put the last four on the center atom here. All right, now at this point, what we'll notice is we'll take stock of whether this does obey the octet rule or not. And what you'll see is that in this structure here, the chlorine has two four electrons from the bonds and then four more as lone pairs so right now the chlorine already has eight electrons as as do the oxygen atoms as well so every every atom in the structure now has eight electrons it obeys the octet rule so we're going to stop there we're not going to draw any double bonds or anything else all right so if we calculate formal charges now that we're, we're asked for the formal charge on the center atom remember that the definition of formal charge is it's the number of valence electrons that the atom has minus the number of bonds. We're basically dividing each bond and sharing it equally. So sorry, number of bonds, not bonding electrons. And then minus the number of non-bonding electrons. All right, so that's the formula we're gonna use. Number of valence electrons that the atom has by itself subtract the number of bonds that it has, which is basically half of the bonding electrons, and then we're going to subtract the number of non-bonding electrons, which count individually. So for chlorine, which is the central atom, we're going to have the valence electrons for chlorine, as we said at the beginning, was seven. Right now, the chlorine has two bonds, 
and it has the number of non-binding electrons is going to be four. One, two, three, four. So right now in this structure where we obey the octet rule, the central atom has a plus one formal charge, and so that's the answer we want to pick for the structure that obeys the octet rule. So this would be plus one. If we calculated oxygen, each of them would be minus one. So it is possible to draw an alternative structure that basically gets rid of this plus one formal charge by, by drawing a double bond between chlorine and one of the oxygens, but that would require us to violate the octet rule and have more than eight electrons around the chlorine. So if we're going to obey the octet rule, we're stuck basically with a plus one formal charge on the central atom, and that's the answer that we want to pick. All right, so any questions on drawing blue structures or calculating formal charges, anything related to that? All right, we'll move on then. Come on. Let me save this so I don't lose my work. Okay, number 14. Number 14, we're in, we're at one of the, uh, I think the last topic for chapter three, which is nomenclature. So we want to select the best name for AL2S3. So the first thing we have to figure out is, if we're naming a compound, is it ionic or covalent? Those are the two major classifications. Ionic compounds, we don't use prefixes. So the big division between these is you don't use prefixes for ionic compounds, and for covalent compounds, we do use prefixes to indicate how many of each atom is in the formula. Okay? Um, and then also within covalent compounds, we also had acids, which have some slightly different rules for nomenclature. But the first thing let's figure out is, is this ionic or covalent? So if we look at the formula Al2S3, to figure out if it's ionic or covalent, we have to figure out what kind of elements we're dealing with here. Um, and so if we go to the, back to the periodic table, find aluminum and sulfur. Aluminum is here, number 13, and that's a metal. It's not the most obvious metal in the periodic table, but it's to the left of the imaginary staircase. And if you ever have trouble remembering that aluminum is a metal, just think of what aluminum foil looks like. It's a silver, shiny, flexible substance, which is what all metals are. So uh, aluminum is clearly a metal. Um, and then sulfur is a non-metal. So Al2S3 is a combination of a metal and a non-metal. Aluminum is a metal. Sulfur is a non-metal. And what that means then is that this compound must be an ionic compound. Because an ionic compound is a combination of a metal, which acts as a cation, with a non-metal or polyatomic anion that acts as the anion. Okay? And so this is an ionic compound, which means we're not going to use any prefixes. Um, and so, in an ionic compound, we have a cation and an anion. The cation, in this case, is the metal, which is aluminum. And in ionic nomenclature, we don't modify the name of the cation unless it's a transition metal. We have to put a number in parentheses, but aluminum is not a transition metal. Aluminum is always plus three. Not that that really matters for this problem. And then for the non-metal part of the formula, for the anion, we just take the root name, which is sulfur, and then we change the ending to IDE. Okay, so the anion gets the IDE ending. All right, so this should just be called aluminum sulfide. So if we go through the answer choices, choice A has a prefix, so that can't be right. Choice B has prefixes on both, dialuminum and trisulfide. We don't use those prefixes for ionics. Choice C, aluminum sulfur, this does not have the correct ending, so that's wrong. This one, aluminum sulfide 2, we never put Roman numerals on the anion, only on the cation if it's a transition metal, so that can't be right. That means choice E is correct, just simply aluminum sulfide. So for ionic compounds, the nomenclature is fairly simple because we don't have to put any prefixes in, we just have to name the cation and the anion only indicating the charge on the cation if it's a transition metal, which has very little charge. All right, so any questions on nomenclature? All right, then wrapping up with the last three here, which are, are going to be related to topics in Chapter 4. Um, the first question here deals with which of the following molecules are linear. So this is essentially a, a molecular shape problem. Um, and as we talked about a lot before, if you have three atoms in the formula, 
it's either going to be linear or bent. All right. So all of these choices have three atoms, CO2, H2O, XeF2, SO2. These are all formulas where you have three atoms in the formula. And so that means the only possibility is that they're linear or bent. Our job is to figure out which one of these, if any, are linear. Um, and so then if you have three atoms in the formula, using the AXE notation, where X designates how many atoms are at the central atom, E designates the number of lone pairs on the central atom, these are all going to be AX2 type structures. So it's either going to be AX2 E0, AX2 E with one lone pair, AX2 E2, AX2 E3. So these are all the possible structures that we can have when you have two atoms bond to the central atom, or a total of three atoms in the formula AX2. You can have no lone pairs in the central atom. You can have one, two, or three lone pairs. And which of these is is, it's going to determine if it's linear or bent. So AX2, where you have no lone pairs in the central atom, in that case, it's going to be linear. You're going to just put the two atoms as far apart from each other as possible. For AX2E and AX2E2, you have one or two lone pairs on the central atom, and these result in bent structures. They would have different bond angles, but still be... Uh, loosely classified as bent for both of them. But then AX2E3, where you put three lone pairs on the central atom, the two X's do end up linear again. So these are all the possibilities for uh, molecules that have only three atoms in their formula. It's all linear or bent, and it's determined by how many lone pairs the central atom has. So for these four choices here, we just need to figure out how many lone pairs on the central atom and then distinguish it as being linear or bent. So if we go through CO2, I'm not going to draw the Lewis structure in detail. We did a Lewis structure problem earlier. But what you should get for CO2 if you draw the Lewis structure is this. So you do have to come up with reasonably good Lewis structures for this. If you're missing some double bonds and things, it's not going to be the end of the world. But you do need to make sure you have the correct number of lone pairs in the central atom. This one comes out to AX2, so that's going to make it linear. If we do H2O, this one we should be able to draw in our sleep at this point. Um, and that's going to be two lone pairs on the oxygen. So it's going to be AX2E2, which is bent. So this one's not linear, it's bent. XCF2 is the weird one of the bunch, I would say. It's probably the most uncommon geometry that we would have, the most common electron group arrangement. But what you get for XCF2 if you draw out the Lewis structure is... All right, so what you get is lone pairs in all the fluorines, but then you end up still with three more on the central atom. So XEF2 is AX2E3. This one, as we said above, is a linear. The, the reason for that is we have five total electron groups, two Xs, three Es, and so they're going to arrange themselves trigonal planar, and you're going to put lone pairs on the triangle, and that's going to leave the two fluorines linear. All right, so AX2E3 is not a particularly common electron group arrangement. It, xenon difluoride is really one of the only ones that has it, especially for neutral molecules. But it, it is one of the linear structures. So this one will be linear. And then if we go to SO2, um, you're going to get this structure here with one or two double bonds, depending on how you draw it. But however you end up drawing SO2, it ends up as AX2E which means that it's bent, okay? So it has one lone pair in the central atom, so it's going to be bent. So that one's not linear either. So the correct answer choice is that choice one, which is CO2, choice three, which is xenon difluoride, both of those would be linear, okay? So that's just a um, relatively simple look at VSCPR determining molecular shapes, where in this case the only options were linear and bent because there's three atoms in the formula. But there are more complicated ones. Um, just review the the different structures that you have, um, you know, helps to be able to draw them and visualize them as well. And there'll be, you know, pretty straightforward questions about how to predict molecular shapes uh, like this. All right, any questions? All right, for 16, we're looking for which of the following has the greatest dipole moment. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind about, so these are all 
molecular dipoles. They're, they're you know molecules that have different numbers of atoms in the formula. And if we're looking for the one that has the greatest dipole moment, we're just going to look for the one that's polar. We're not going to really ask you to rank the polarity of molecules against each other. You can rank the polarity of individual bonds against each other. That's determined by the electronegativity differences. But if we're talking about molecular polarity, it's either going to be polar or nonpolar. That's the only distinction we have to make. And so if you're looking for the one with the greatest dipole moment, it would typically be the case that one of these is polar and the rest are nonpolar. Nonpolar means zero dipole moment. Anything that's polar has a dipole moment that's not zero. Okay? Um, and so we just have to go through these structures then and figure out which ones are polar or nonpolar, which also comes from their geometries. So the first choice is CCL4. And again, without going through too many details on drawing it, the Lewis structure for this one, not too difficult because carbon always has four bonds. So if it's CCL4, it's just going to form single bonds to all four chlorines. You're going to get AX4. And in any of the structures where you have no lone pairs on the central atom, as long as all of the outer atoms are the same, in this case it's all chlorine, no lone pairs on the central atom it has to be nonpolar. All right. And if we go to PF5, this is going to be another one where we end up with no lone pairs on the central atom. A bunch of lone pairs on fluorine, which is going to get a little bit crowded here, but no lone pairs on the central atom for this one either. So this one is AX5. All of the outer atoms are the same. They're all fluorine. No lone pairs on the central atom means that it's nonpolar. That's true for AX2, AX3, AX4, AX5, AX6. As long as there's no lone pairs in the center atom, as long as the two, or sorry, as long as the outer atoms are all the same. If we go to O2, this is the easy one because it's a diatomic. In a diatomic molecule, a molecule that only has two atoms in it, it's going to be nonpolar if the two atoms are the same, meaning they have the same electronegativity. It's going to be polar if the two atoms are different. So O2 must be nonpolar because it's two of the same atom bonded to itself. All right, and then if we go to xenon tetrafluoride, another xenon fluoride. Again, these xenon compounds are not the most simple or obvious. They're not very common either, but they do exist. And what you get for xenon tetrafluoride is the four fluorines all bonded with single bonds. For polarity, you don't really care too much about whether it's a single double or triple bond, just whether or not there's lone pairs on the central atoms, the, the more important thing. And you do end up, though, with two lone pairs in the central atom. Now the structures that have two lone pairs on the central atom, some of them are polar, some of them are not. This one would be AX4E2, and the structure that you get for AX4E2 is the six electron groups are going to go into an octahedral arrangement, and you're going to have the lone pairs 180 degrees apart on opposite sides, and that's going to leave the four fluorines in the square plane. So this would be called a square or square planar structure. And square planar does give us a nonpolar uh, molecular dipole moment. It's nonpolar. And that's because you have the four xenon fluorine bonds, but there's going to be two pairs that are arranged 180 degrees apart, and so those dipoles are going to cancel out. So this was not the most obvious one. It has two lone pairs, and this one would, though, give us a nonpolar geometry. So all of the first four choices are nonpolar, meaning they have zero dipole moment, so we better hope that choice E, which is NF3, has a dipole moment of some sort. If we do NF3, what we end up with is this with one lone pair on the center atom, so it's AX3E. And a helpful thing to remember for questions that deal with molecular polarity is that anything with one lone pair on the center atom, it doesn't matter if the three outer atoms are the same, it doesn't matter how many outer atoms you have, any of the structures that have a single lone pair on the center atom must be polar. Right? There's no way around that. So this one would definitely be polar. It's the only one that has a non-zero dipole moment because it's the only one that is polar, which means that this would be the answer that we would pick. So anything that's non-polar has zero dipole moment. We're looking for the greatest dipole moment, so that has to be the one that is polar, even to a small extent being polar would make it uh, the greatest dipole moment in this case. All right, so any questions on molecular polarity?
All right, quick check to make sure I didn't miss any. All right, last thing that I'll cover then is number 17, um, which deals with hybridization and how many sigma bonds there are. This is really, um, you know, two questions in one. It's not formatted particularly like you would see an exam question, but it does help us to review this topic a little bit more um, in detail. And so we want to know first hybridization and then second, um, you know, how many sigma and I guess just to say sigma bonds are there. Okay, so we're going to draw the Lewis structure first. And for organic compounds like this that are mostly carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, maybe nitrogen, we learned earlier some shortcuts for doing it. All right, so the two carbons are going to be bonded to each other. The first carbon, CH3, means that it's bonded to three hydrogens. And then COOH, so that means we're going to have one oxygen bonded to carbon and then another oxygen that also has a hydrogen on it. And to finish up the Lewis structure for this, the shortcuts that we can use are going to be typically, well, hydrogen always just forms one bond, of course. Um, we can write that in, I guess. All right, if you draw anything other than one bond to hydrogen, if you try to put lone pairs on it, if you try to draw more than one bond, um, you're in trouble. And as I said earlier, that every time that happens, a small piece of me dies, and I just don't like to see it. So don't do anything more than one bond to hydrogen. The rest of these are not as obvious, but there is a pattern that they mostly follow. So you have carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen being the three most common elements that you'll find in these sort of organic structures, as they're called, which you'll learn all about if you take organic chemistry. And for carbon, and they all want to form complete octets, they all want to typically have zero formal charge. And the way that that occurs is in carbon, you're going to have four bonds and zero lone pairs on the carbon. For nitrogen, you would have three bonds and one lone pair. So all of these add up to eight total valence electrons, just common, different combinations of bonding and non-bonding electrons. And then oxygen, two of each. Two bonds and two lone pairs to complete the octet of oxygen. So that's the pattern that we want to follow here. And so if we look at acetic acid, which is not a typically a particularly large structure, we see that this first carbon already has four bonds, three to hydrogens, one to carbon. So we don't want to add any more bonds to the carbon on the left. If we go to this one here, though, right now it only has three bonds. And we see that this oxygen only has one. And so the way that we can address that is by drawing a double bond. That results, maybe, um, there we go. That results in having two bonds to oxygen, and now this carbon has four bonds. And then each oxygen should also have two lone pairs. So we put two lone pairs there. This oxygen gets two lone pairs and has the two other bonds. So all the atoms now in this structure follow this set of rules, which means that they obey the octet rule and there's not gonna be any formal charges. We could have done this by counting electrons and doing all the, the whole shebang for Lewis structure that we normally do, but this shortcut can be helpful for some of these types of problems, where it's a larger formula with you know, more than one central atom and all those things. So what this question is getting at then is, first of all, the hybridization of each carbon atom. So let me label these as one and two. So C1, carbon one, remember that for hybridization, we're gonna just count the number of electron groups on that carbon, the number of things it's attached to, where each thing is either an atom or a lone pair, and then we're going to hybridize that many orbitals. So C1 is going to have four electron groups, or a steric number of four, as we sometimes say. And the available orbitals for hybridization are an s orbital and three p orbitals. And because it has four electron groups, it needs to hybridize all four of those. And so that's going to be sp3. And then for the second carbon, C2, in this case, what we see is it's bounded to one oxygen, one carbon, and then a second oxygen, so a total of three things. Remember, for counting electron groups, we don't care whether it's a single or a double bond, it's just the number of electron groups that are coming off of that carbon. So there's three things attached to this second carbon, and that means for hybridization, we're gonna have, we still have the same orbitals available, S and three Ps, but because we only have three electron groups, we're only gonna hybridize three orbitals. So what we're going to get is sp2 hybridization for the second carbon, and we're going to leave one p orbital unhybridized, which is going to be involved in forming this double bond. And then finally, the second part of this question is how many sigma bonds are there? So remember that if you have a single bond in a structure using the localized bonding model, the um, valence bond approaches this is called, that will be a, single, a sigma bond. If you have a double bond in your structure, 
that's going to be one sigma and one pi. And then if you have a triple bond, it's going to be one sigma and two pi's. So basically with the, the valence bond approach, every bond involves a sigma bond. And then if you have a multiple bond, the rest are going to be pi. So double will be one sigma, one pi, triple one sigma, two pi. So in this structure here, to count how many sigma bonds we have, each single bond is sigma. So we have a sigma, 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 sigma. All four of those are sigmas. And this double bond is going to be one sigma and one pi. And then these last two single bonds are sigma as well. So we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sigma bonds. So the second part of this answer would be seven sigma bonds. I didn't specify the format for this answer. So in a blackboard question, this would be multiple choice or short answer. And this is how you would get hybridization and number of sigma bonds. All right, so we're done with the first half. Um, we'll do the rest tomorrow. Um, so are there any questions on the first half of that review? Anything related to, to these topics that you want me to go over in more detail? All right. Uh, as I anticipated, it was a relatively small. All right, so the question came in is, is there any exception for the octet rule? So I'll cover that quickly. So for the octet rule, um, Let's go back to that problem, I guess, um, where that was most relevant. Uh, so that was this one up here where we asked about the octet rule. So basically, um, let me just, so octet rule exceptions. There's sort of two to keep in mind. This, it's not, so one thing is that if you have an atomic number greater than 10, meaning that the atom is in the um, second, or sorry, in the third row of the periodic table or below, these can expand their octets, the central atom in particular. Okay, so if the, if the central atom is in the third row of the periodic table or beyond, it can expand the octet, meaning it can have more than eight electrons around that. And that's why in problems like this, we would typically specify whether or not you should obey the octet rule if it's relevant. Because in this structure here, we, if we could have expanded the octet on chlorine because it's in the third row of the periodic table, and we could have drawn a structure that had less formal charge in it. But to do that would require us to exceed the octet rule, which is why we specified in here that we should obey the octet rule. But if the central atom is... Uh, atomic number greater than 10, meaning it's in the third row of the periodic table or beyond, you can expand the octet on the central atom and go beyond eight electrons. The other common exceptions you're going to see are going to be there's two elements that typically would have less than eight electrons in most structures, especially if there's no charge involved. So if you have beryllium, that's going to tend to have four electrons around it as a central atom, and then boron tends to have six valence electrons, less than eight electrons. So those are the most common exceptions to the octet rule. It's very common in the heavier elements when they're the central atom to expand the octet as a way of basically minimizing formal charge. That's something you can do. And if we specify that you should minimize formal charge, then you might need to do this in many cases to get the lowest formal charge as possible. But other cases, these elements cannot go beyond eight electrons because they're in the second row. And 95% of the time they're going to have less than eight electrons, four for beryllium, six for boron. So those are the common exceptions that you will sometimes see uh, to the octet rule. All right, any other questions on this on these topics? All right, um, going uh, once, going twice. All right, so I'm going to close this out then and uh, let you guys all go. I'm sure many of you probably are still waiting to take the exam tonight. So uh, I know there's a small and per perhaps not terribly interested crowd, but I appreciate all of you being here and listening in. Um, and then tomorrow we'll hopefully have a bigger group to go over the second half. Uh, in terms of office hours for this week, I guess I could send an email about this, but um, I'll be around almost all day every day. So... Uh, most office hours I'll be doing by appointment, but anytime you want to meet to discuss anything, um, please let me know. And then if you have other questions that you prefer to get answered by email, please go ahead and send those to me as you prepare for your last two exams.
All right. So everybody uh, take care and I will uh, see most, hopefully most of you tomorrow as well.